Hello everyone, the following video is a short summary of the membership training course which was undertaken in October 2022 and the reason for this video is to give a short summary to our existing members and uh, future potential members as well. Uh, this, this summary is not intended as a substitute for actually taking the course but it's, uh, I hope it's helpful nonetheless. So our first session that we went through was looking at church membership itself, uh, who should become a member of a church, what it means to become a member of a church, why would you become a member, and how do you become a member. And uh, we began from the outset by saying that these studies do not automatically qualify you to become a member of Grace Evangelical, and it does not uh, place any obligation on you following the training to do so but purely to help introduce our church to you and for, you, for us to help get to know you as well and uh, for you to be informed as to when you make a decision as to whether or not you want to actually become a member. So we talked a wee bit about um, our background here in New Zealand with uh, New Zealand society seemingly built on a foundation of uh, autonomy, individualism, with a real commitment to having a freedom from all sorts of hierarchy and uh, we see that obviously in our society today. And because of this commitment to any authority, including uh, under a church structure, is uh, misunderstood and wildly unpopular. So we said at Grace Evangelical, what we really want is to have a biblical and very clear and defined understanding of what church membership is. And in, in so doing, we will be combating worldly individualism and experience the blessings of God that do flow through church membership. So we began by uh, speaking basically uh, what, what church membership means, uh, giving a definition. So with carefully chosen words, church membership may be defined as a formal agreement made between a Christian and a local church together with its elders and members to commit to one another, to be accountable to one another, and to love one another. And you can hear in that definition the background of uh, many Bible verses in the New Testament where we are exhorted to uh, commit to one another as believers in Christ, as uh, beloved members of one body, and obviously our, the local body being the local church. Now, when it comes to being biblical in our approach to defining church membership, you might have noticed that the Bible nowhere has a very tidy verse explaining what church membership is, uh, much like we don't have a tidy verse uh, summarizing the doctrine of the Trinity. Nevertheless, we believe it because it's what the Bible teaches. And uh, similarly, when it comes to the Bible and church membership, the Bible tells us three things. First of all, um, because of the relationship of the individual Christians with the elders of the church. And we went through several passages um, of scripture that talk about the relationship of individual Christians with the elders, including Hebrews 13, 17, where we're told to obey our leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. And several other um, passages there showing that the individual Christian does, has a, does have a relationship to the elders of their local church, much like the elders of the local church have a relationship to the individual Christians within the body. The second point was the relationship to the corporate body of the individual Christian with the corporate body. And uh, we looked at church discipline. So Matt, uh, in Matthew 18, Jesus tells us that if our brother sins against us, we are to go and tell him his fault between you and him alone, and if he listens to you, then you've gained your brother. But so that's there's there's a stage, there's a process of church discipline for a biblical church. So it begins with the one-on-one, -on -one, and then if he doesn't listen, you take two, uh, one or two others with along with you, and then if he refuses to listen to them, and then you tell the entire church. And if he refuses to listen to the church, Jesus says, let him be to you as a gentile and a tax collector. Now, obviously, it's uh, impossible to go through this church discipline process if you don't know who is in the church. Like, you don't uh, take this process, you don't undertake 
the process of church discipline with non-members, with someone who's visiting your church. Um, so yes, the, the process of church discipline itself is a good reason, biblical reason for why there should be church membership so that people know who is in their church and the elders know who they're responsible for. And uh, the, the process of church discipline can proceed from there. 1 Corinthians 5 uh, also has a section about church discipline and, a, and a, an example of church discipline in a local church. So the, the meaning, the reason for church discipline is to try and bring repentance in the life of the person who is turned away. And uh, without church membership, you cannot have church discipline. So that's the second point there. The third biblical point as to why church discipline is important was that uh, in the Bible we see um, teaching regarding the relationship of the individual Christian with the other members of the church. Um, so for example, 1 Corinthians 12, uh, a metaphor is used often throughout the New Testament that the church is, is like a body. So the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. But much like our body is made up of several members which work together for the good of the entire body, uh, so too the church is made up of members who work together for the good of the body in glorifying the Lord Jesus Christ. So this, this metaphor describes mutual um, dependence on one another and a commitment to one another. Uh, while acknowledging the fact that we are different from each other, we still actually need each other. So that uh, the relationship to the other members of being like a body shows us that we really need to know who the other parts of the body are in church membership. And then at the end of the session, we talked about how the agreement is made. And the answer is, is it's actually done formally. So the members of the church will vote along with the elders to bring someone into membership. So the elders will uh, recommend a person having um, understood that they have a credible profession of faith. And then the members vote together. So that, that process itself is not actually in the Bible um, about how to become a church member. Much like the Bible does not have uh, a marriage ceremony or marriage vows, you know, spoken about in in the Word, but uh, because marriage is a lifelong commitment, um, and we add the public ceremony and the vows because we recognise the significance of it, so too in church membership, it's appropriate that this agreement is made publicly for the sake of accountability um, and and for us to know who we're meant to be uh, loving as our fellow church members. We then went on to our second session of church membership, which was called uh, The Foundations of Our Faith. And we actually took the opportunity to hand out the uh, church statement of faith and to talk about it together. So we handed it out the week before. People had the chance to read over it and ask questions. So we spoke about um, our, our church has a statement of faith, which is very useful because um, it reflects it, it's it's useful in that in as much as it reflects the accurate biblical teaching, and uh, becoming a member means that basically you are accepting and affirming the statement of faith for our church. So you agree not to speak against it or contrary to it in the church, and uh, in this way our church is made up of like-minded members, which is very important for the unity of a church. So in our uh, in the statement of faith itself, um, it begins with the Bible as our authority. And we spoke about our, the reason for that being that we are Christians and we follow Christ. And he, uh, Jesus Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ, takes as his authority the word of God. And you see that in his teaching. Also, because of the background of the Reformation, uh, in which Martin Luther and the, Ref the early reformers saw that the one of the main... Uh, one of the main issues behind the Reformation was that of authority. Do we accept the Pope, the papacy, the the, church, the Roman leadership, the, the leadership of the church in Rome and uh, so-called church tradition as authoritative, um, along with the Bible, which is the three-pronged stool that the Roman Catholic Church uses in their authority structure? Or do we, as the reformers uh, proclaimed, say sola scriptura only the bible the bible alone is our god-given infallible god-breathed god-inspired uh, word that we can use as the 
uh, basis of our of our faith and, our, and of our belief. So in some ways, the first point of our um, statement of faith really gives us the foundation from which all the other statements flow. Um, so it's a very important point. Uh, now, point two talks about God's uh, independence and sovereignty. We spent, um, I spent several sessions, several sermons going over um, that as a foundation in uh, early 2022 when we were going through Genesis, talking about God's independence and sovereignty as a foundation of our belief system. Uh, point three talks about the work and person of Jesus Christ. We speak about the fact that he is God incarnate, God become man, that uh, Jesus is our prophet, the one who speaks the word of God to us. He is our, our priest. He is the one who made the perfect sacrifice of his own body and blood to completely cleanse us from our sin. And he's our king, where our allegiance goes to Christ, and we follow him. Uh, point four talks about the work of the Holy Spirit. Um, and when we're, when we're talking about the work of the Holy Spirit, we're mainly talking about the work of regeneration, whereby he makes us alive. We who were dead in sins, trespasses and sins, and uh, walking away from God, he came to us first and regenerated us, made us alive in Christ. So that's by grace we've been saved through faith, not of ourselves, but a gift of God. And then uh, points five to nine basically s teach the reform distinctives. So we spent some time, most of our time, going over points five to nine. Um, we spoke about the five solas of the Reformation, which are um, sola scriptura. Scripture alone is our authority. Sola Christus, so Christ alone is our mediator. We don't go through... Uh, Mary or angels or saints, uh, sola fide, only by faith alone are we saved, not through our works and faith. Sola gratia, grace alone is entirely sufficient to save us. It's not grace plus our own works. And then solo, soli de, uh, deo gloria, which is the all the glory goes to God alone. So we don't venerate saints or angels or Mary or any other such thing. So those five statements really lie at the the foundation of evangelical belief, and it's what helped distinguish the Church of the Reformation from the theology of the Roman Catholic Church in the 16th century and beyond. We also spent some time going over TULIP, T-U-L-I-P, upon which some of those points are um, taken from. So T being the total depravity of the human condition, and that we are dead in our sins and unable to morally submit to the law of God or please God. Uh, we looked at unconditional election, T-U, so unconditional election. God elects us by his grace alone and according to his will alone. It's not that he sees anything in us that can, is a, as a condition for why he chooses us. Limited atonement, we spoke about um, the fact that the reformers in our church limits the atonement in its scope, as opposed to limiting the atonement in its effect, which is what other churches do. So we speak about the fact that Jesus died to perfectly save his people. He died to per he, he laid down his life for his sheep to perfectly save them. So we limit the atonement in the fact that we say Jesus did not lay down his life for the goats or the wolves to perfectly save them, but he did it for his sheep. And then the next point is I, irresistible grace, and it speaks about the fact that when Jesus saves us, he uh, irresistibly overcomes our rebellion against him uh, through his grace. His, the Holy Spirit brings us to spiritual life and gives faith and gives repentance as gifts, and then we exercise those gifts as well. So it's a wee bit akin to uh, Jesus calling forth Lazarus from the tomb in the Words themselves, uh, Lazarus come forth, the son of powerful son of God gave life and gave belief and and gave uh, the ability for Lazarus, who was a dead corpse, remember, to come forth out of the tomb. So the irresistible grace of God. And then finally, P, the perseverance of the saints. Uh, we accept and believe and affirm that once a person has been saved by God, he will necessarily persevere to the end because the Lord Jesus Christ who holds him in his hand will never let him go, will never let him out. 
and the Lord Jesus will continue until the day of Christ, that good work that he has started in you. So we went over the reform distinctives. And then verse uh, point 10 um, speaks about the literal bodily resurrection of uh, the Lord Jesus, as opposed to, uh, in New Zealand history, the obviously the liberal approach of saying that uh, Jesus didn't literally rise, but uh, the idea that it was uh, uh, the idea of Christ raised again in the minds of the disciples. There are people who teach things like that, whereas our church affirms the truth of the Bible, that Jesus uh, bodily rose from the dead, and we affirm eternal conscious punishment over and against annihilationism. We spoke a wee bit about that. And then um, point 11 talks about the government of the local church. Uh, we are a congregational church with a constitution. Uh, we vote for specific things, but we do have um, elders who um, oversee the church and have authority in spiritual matters. And also we have uh, deacons as well. And then at the end, uh, the, the last two points of foundation the foundations of our faith are the two ordinances, which we actually separated into session three. So session three, we uh, took the time to go over the Reformed Baptist, the London uh, Reformed Baptist Confession of Faith from the 1689 Confession to speak about uh, chapters 28 through 30, which deals with the ordinances. Uh, we spoke about baptism chiefly that the meaning of baptism is that it is a sign or symbol of fellowship with Christ in death and resurrection, being grafted into him, remission of sins, and submitting to God through Christ. So baptism itself is only for those who personally profess repentance towards God and faith and obedience towards Jesus. So uh, baptism being the answer of a good conscience towards God, we said that it is not uh, suitable for Infants to be baptized, those who cannot make a credible profession of faith. We talked about uh, baptism being an outward element. It's a, an outward sign of something that has inwardly occurred, and that baptism should be part, uh, done by immersion, not through sprinkling, as uh, some traditions like to do. We also spent some time going over the Lord's Supper, saying that it was instituted by Christ and for us to be obedient to him. We should observe it at church. Our church uh, in our constitution says that the Lord's Supper must be uh, undertaken at least once a month. We spoke about how the Lord's Supper is a perpetual remembrance and display of his sacrifice. It's not a, a representation of his sacrifice. At no point does uh, the bread or the wine become the actual literal uh, body and blood of Christ as the Roman Catholic uh, institution has taught in the past under the name transubstantiation. So our reformed tradition um, holds that the Lord Jesus Christ instituted this as a remembrance for him, not as a representation of a sacrifice. Um, we spoke about how the Lord's Supper is a confirmation for our faith and for our spiritual growth, um, and it's for believers and not at all for those who are unworthy to partake, who will eat and drink judgment on themselves. So our constitution actually um, says that when the Lord's Supper is taken, that there must be a warning given along the lines of what is said in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 11. So that was session three. And then in session four, we went over seven distinctives of Grace Evangelical Church, uh, specifically starting off with the fact that for someone to become a member, they must have, have undergone genuine conversion. That means that they have genuine repentance uh, and genuine faith, and they have genuinely turned their life over to God, that they are following Christ as their Lord and Savior. Uh, now, we're not looking for perfection, obviously, but there should be a difference in your pre-Christ and post-Christ life. Uh, so this begins with a confession that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, the Lord and Savior of your life, and that there is a commitment to follow him for your whole life. Uh, now, this needs to be demonstrated through uh, public baptism. And if you have been baptized in another church, water baptized as, a, as an adult, uh, we do accept um, baptisms from other churches. But if you have not undergone that, then uh, we will look to um, see you baptized before becoming a member. 
Uh, the second C is a commitment, and we spoke about several sub, sub points to that commitment. So basically becoming a member of Grace Evangelical means that you're committing to the Lord's Day meetings uh, in as much as you can make it. So it doesn't mean you're not allowed to go on holiday. Of course, um, when you do go on holiday, we would uh, recommend and request that you do, um, if you're not in Hamilton for the weekend, that you do try and find fellowship on this on the Lord's Day um, to continue uh, walking in God's grace and faith and uh, not to not to uh, allow the hint of a drifting in your heart to occur. So a commitment to the Lord's Day means that you are committing to gather with us uh, as much in as much as you can on, on the Sunday mornings. Uh, we ask for commitment to the means of grace and mutual encouragement. So that means um, basically uh, the, the, the ways that God blesses his church, the means of grace, you're committing to partake in them. That means... Uh, being a part of the teaching of the word, listening to the word being taught, uh, being baptized if you haven't, and supporting other people in their baptism, joining in with the Lord's Supper. Um, so being careful not to eat and drink judgment on yourself. Now, the Lord's Supper is a means of grace uh, because if you do it wrongly, you are judged. So uh, logically, if you do it correctly, then you get a blessing. So uh, look to uh, commit to being a part of that with the rest of the church. Committing to pray um, for one another is another part of that. Committing to worship the Lord with uh, with your brothers and sisters at church. To commit to church discipline, the process itself, and to being under that um, yourself. To commit to giving to the church and financially supporting the church. Um, to commit to spiritual gifts, exercising uh, spiritual gifts uh, for the good of the, the body of the church. And commit to fellowship with one another. Uh, personal evangelism and personal ministry to one another as we love one another as God has called us. So uh, the second commitment, sorry, the third commitment there on the list was leadership. So basically uh, in committing to become a member of Grace Evangelical Church, you are committing to support the elders who have been appointed by God through the, the process of the Constitution um, and, and in, in accordance with our voting process. You're also committing to meetings in as much as you can. The meetings are on other days. We have several midweek meetings, and hopefully more will be um, happening in the future. So prayer meetings, midweek Bible studies, things like that. In as much as you can, uh, meet together to encourage one another. And you're uh, much like in the early church when the people would devote themselves to the apostles' teaching and breaking of bread together and uh, praying and fasting together. Becoming a member of Grace Evangelical Church is basically making the statement, I'm committing my life to, uh, in as much as I can, join in these meetings and to be a blessing to my brothers and sisters. Uh, the fourth commitment there, financially, we talked about partnering in the gospel, as uh, Paul mentions in Philippians chapter 1, verse 5, that um, basically financial giving should be, first of all, cheerful and not under compulsion. So we, we went over um, 2 Corinthians 9 and, and, and chapter 8 and Acts chapter 20, looking at um, how giving is basically meant to be a cheerful thing in order to be, to be blessed by God. It's, it's more blessed to give than to receive. And uh, giving should be according to a person's means. You should not give beyond your, your means necessarily but if it makes you not cheerful. But if you're cheerful in giving, that's, that's what we're looking for. Uh, we also spoke about Mark chapter 12, verses 41 through 44, where um, Jesus teaches us that our, our giving should be sacrificial. It should be radical and extravagant. And we looked over several passages um, in the New Testament. Mark 14, verses 3 to 9 is another good passage. And Philippians 4, 14 to 19. We spoke about how financial giving should be flowing out of love and gratitude from 2 Corinthians chapter 8. And we spoke about how financial support for the church should be secret, uh, according to Jesus' teaching in Matthew 6, 1 to 4, and Mark 12, 38 through 40. So the, uh, the fifth point of commitment of the church is that you are committing to outreach. Um, basically, as disciples of Christ, we are all called to follow the Great Commission, to be a part of Matthew 28, 18 to 20. Uh, 
obeying the commandments of Jesus locally and internationally. So you are committing to support evangelism through evangelizing, evangelizing yourself um, as well and supporting those who evangelize through prayer and supplication. So uh, the, those first two points there, conversion and commitment, were covered at that point. We then talked about how our church, another distinctive of our church is that we are constitutional. We act according to a written document, which is our constitution. So the purpose, the preamble of our constitution reads like this. We commit ourselves to peaceably abide by the statement of faith and constitution. We enter voluntarily into membership of the Grace Evangelical Church to submit to the Bible, to worship God as he is appointed, serving him faithfully according to our abilities, living lives of holiness and caring for one another with brotherly love, supporting and encouraging one another in faith, especially by prayer, giving according to our means and meeting together for prayer, worship and instruction. So if uh, you read through our constitution there, you'll see a lot more about um, the direction our church is going. But basically, we are trying to be a biblical and faithful church following the Lord Jesus Christ. So included in our constitutional section there is talking about the fact that we are a congregational uh, church. We, go under, we undergo a voting process to uh, make decisions, which means we're really acknowledging God's hand in directing the congregation. And it's not that the, the church is led by one person and one, you know, uh, personality. It's that the church is led by God. And so we acknowledge him uh, through our constitution and our congreg congregational approach. We also spoke about the process of church discipline as being another distinctive of our church in that we try in, as much as possible to follow Matthew 18 the process um, and 1 Corinthians 5 as much as possible following the Lord Jesus and disciplining members of our church when needed. We spoke about how the church is confessional and that we uh, follow the 1689 Reformed Baptist Confession. Although we don't view the confession as divinely inspired and so we don't necessarily require every member to fully subscribe to the confession. We do value it as a systematic summary of what the scriptures teach, and so we, we require the leadership to agree to the foundational principles of a Baptist view of Reformed theology, which includes a few more C's in here, so Calvinism, uh, credo-baptism, as opposed, so, so you have to believe in order to be baptized, um, covenant theology, uh, as opposed to some form of dispensationalism, uh, and also cessationism. So we, we don't believe that uh, there are any apostles running around today um, with the authority uh, directly from Christ to speak to our congregation, for example. We believe the gift of apostleship has ceased. Um, and uh, we also, the, the distinctive there is, is a wee bit deeper and too much to get into in this video. But basically, if someone comes up to you in the church and said, um, God told me that we're going to be married, that person would be disciplined and uh, we would reject that kind of uh, prophetic utterance in our church. Uh, the next point there, the sixth one, complementarian. So we believe uh, in the complementarian theology. We're not egalitarian. We're not feminists. We believe that the beauty of Christ and his church is reflected in the relationships of husbands and wives and also in roles at the church. So. Uh, there's much more to get into there, but it is a distinctive of the church. We spoke about that at length in the session. Uh, and then lastly, we uh, another distinctive of Grace Evangelical is that we uh, believe in connections with other churches. We are not looking to be um, out on our own in the wilderness, uh, but we do recognize and appreciate the ministry of other churches. And so we're looking to be connected to them um, in, as much as possible. Now, part of that uh, hopefully will be becoming part of the Fellowship of Reformed Baptist Churches in New Zealand. Um, so although we are independ <coughs> independent in that we don't have a bishop over our denomination, we're not absolutely independent. And we, we do join with other churches in things like church camps and other beneficial things that can happen with other churches, evangelism, things like that. So hopefully that was a uh, helpful little summary of church membership training as undertaken at Grace Evangelical Church. If you do have further questions, uh, please do 
uh, ask us in the group chat or yeah, ask the leadership of the church. May God bless you all.